Hi, my name is Abby and I'm one of the pastors here at HTBB. And I'm so glad to be with you and to continue on in our series in 1 Thessalonians, How to Be a Model Christian. Last week, Miles kicked us off and he taught us how to live like Jesus based on three pillars, faith, love, and hope. And he set the context in which 1 Thessalonians was written. It was a church plant um, by St. Paul, who'd been there for three weeks before he was forced out of the city and they were left to figure out how to live the Christian life by themselves. And so 1 Thessalonians was written to help them understand and give them tools in how to live their life. Now, Miles does a much better job at explaining the context. So if you haven't watched his sermon from last week, I'd recommend you go back some point this week. It's definitely worthwhile to watch. Today, I want to talk about this idea of becoming. The idea that who we believe we are impacts who we become. And you'll have definitely been asked this question before. What do you want to be when you grow up? The school that I went to, they gave us three options for this. You could either be a teacher, a doctor, or an engineer. And for the rest of us who didn't fall into that category, we were sent to the school library and we had to take a careers quiz on this computer that literally looked like it had been dragged from the 1950s. And it was all within the hopes that you would answer the questions and they would present you with a suitable career path. The career that was suggested to me, become a gardener. Now, considering my only experience of gardening was that I stuck my toe in a running lawnmower at the age of four, this didn't really feel like my life's calling. And our society is built upon the idea of us planning our futures, of dreaming of our careers, of spending our time achieving things. And we live with this expectation that we have to be something, we have to find our purpose, we have to make a difference. And I think that's a constant, no matter what stage of life you may find yourself at. And if it was hard before, then you throw the C word into the mix, COVID, and this year has felt on hold. We've been adapting for now, but kind of hoping life will return to normal soon. Maybe you feel stunted by this year, or maybe your circumstances are less than ideal, or maybe you're questioning, what am I supposed to be doing next? God's primary will for your life isn't just the circumstances you inhabit, but the person that you become. So how do we make sure that our lives are about not just what we do, but who we are becoming? We're going to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 today. I'm going to read it for us. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. And in fact, you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do so more and more, for you know what instructions we give you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality and that each of you should learn to control your body in a way that's holy and honourable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who don't know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you His Holy Spirit. Now, about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Today, I want to explore what God's will for your life is and how that outworks practically. And it all begins with an understanding of who we are. That's where Paul starts with the Thessalonians. He says in verse three, 
it's God's will for your life that you should be sanctified. Now, sanctified or sanctification is just this theological term that essentially means the process of becoming holy. And Paul doesn't really unpack it for us here, but he says, this is God's will for your life. And so I'd like you to take a moment and think about how you define yourself. Not by your job or by what other people call you, but at your core, when roles and titles and achievements are removed, who are you? Because who we believe we are impacts who we become. And God wants us to become holy. So, for example, if we believe that we are unloved or a disappointment or broken, then our lives will reflect those beliefs. We will produce fruit like that in our lives. But when we accept Jesus, when we ask him for forgiveness, we accept what he says about us. And he says, your identity isn't rooted in who you were in the past. Your identity is rooted in who I say you are. And there are so many things that Jesus says about us in the New Testament. We read that we are loved, that we are pure, we are chosen, we are children of God, we are holy. And so sanctification is like this process where we get rid of those beliefs about who we once were and we fully turn to embrace and accept who Jesus says that we are. And it's not a one-off action, it takes time because some of those things might still be present in our minds or within arm's reach. But as we live each day fully accepting, secure in who God says we are, we'll begin to see that our lives will change, that how we think and act and make decisions will start to produce fruit that reflects these beliefs. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we become holy. And that's where Paul starts with the Thessalonians. He says, you guys are doing a great job, but more is more, keep going. And I think there are two themes that emerge from this passage, self-control and ambition. Now, those sound like they're in conflict with one another. You know, self-control kind of conjures up those images of limits and boundaries and being reserved, whereas ambition is like limitless and boundless and being unreserved. But what we'll learn is how these qualities work together within the Christian life. And the first is becoming self-controlled. A few years ago, my husband Stu and I, we drove up to the Cameron Highlands. Now, I'm sure loads of you know that road from KL, but if you don't, it's just this twisty, windy road that goes up the side of a mountain and there's a sheer drop on one side. But the view is beautiful. There's tea plantations and the mountains and the forest. It's incredible. And on the way back down from our trip, I wanted to take a picture. So Stu stopped the car and he jumped out to go and take a photograph. And as I was sitting in the passenger seat and I was watching him take the photo, I suddenly felt the car start to roll towards the edge of the cliff. And I literally have never felt more out of control. Now, rest assured, the crisis was averted. We didn't fall into the depths of the Malaysian jungle, but we did, however, learn the importance of a handbrake. There are some things that are inside our control that we have control over and some things that we don't. Like, look at this year. If there has ever been a time where we've all felt out of control, it's been this past 12 months. And that's led us to feeling worried and uncertain and a bit stressed. When we don't have control over things, we can feel helpless. And the good news here is, although we don't have control over everything in our lives, Paul tells us what we do have control over. In verse three and four, he says this, it's God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality and that you should learn to control your body in a way that is holy and honourable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who don't know God. We are given the dignity and the responsibility of self-control. And in this area, Paul's talking about it specifically for our own bodies. 
I think the reason that he's talking about this for the Thessalonians is, well, they weren't the most squeaky clean. They lived in a culture that didn't have that many rules around sex and their society tolerated things that even Netflix would be shook by. And so Paul has to teach these new Christians how to live surrounded by sexual immorality and how to equip them in becoming self-controlled in this area. And I think briefly, there are two practical things that we can take from this. Um, in the area of being self-controlled, Paul says, firstly, avoid it. That's what he says in verse three. And, and not in like a cop out kind of way, but in a way that you have been given self-control, you can learn it, so practice it. Create distance from it. Separate yourselves from sexual immorality. The second practical thing that we learn is give honor in verse four and five. He instructs them to not take advantage of people in this area, to give honour to themselves, give honour to other people. Because when we honour ourselves and we honour other people in this area, we're honouring God. And so these instructions were to be an encouragement to the Thessalonians, a clear way to be distinct in their culture and an opportunity to model the Christian life to those who don't know God. We live in a world that's full of self, preference, and the right to express desire. And the boundary of what's okay differs from person to person. Sexual immorality here is defined as pornea, which essentially means sex in the wrong place for the wrong purpose. And God's design for sex is really good. It's actually a priority. It's one of the first instructions that we read in the Bible back in Genesis chapter 128. God says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and increase in number. And at a wedding ceremony, when we read out the liturgy, it defines the purpose of sex as for the strengthening of marriage, the creation of children and joy. We're meant to enjoy it. And so as we learn to control our bodies, it's about becoming holy and fully grasping that we are children of God. Because when we agree with the value that God has placed on our lives, we can bring honour to ourselves by enjoying God's gift of sex in the best way possible, the way that He has designed it. But just because we know we can grow in self-control and that we are holy, it doesn't mean that this is easy, that the struggles and the temptation just automatically disappear. This is hard. Passionate lust is real. St. Francis of Assisi was a monk and he referred to his body as brother donkey. And he said it was a beloved part of him, but it was kind of had a mind of its own and really needed tamed like a wild animal. Jesus teaches that we're not donkeys, but we are temples. And the whole reason why we can learn to become self-controlled in this area is because we can have the Holy Spirit. Verse eight, God who gives you his Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that produces and grows self-control in us. So I want to encourage you today, if you do feel guilt or shame in this area, that God sees you as holy. He sees that you can overcome and He is calling you into more and more with Him. We would love to be able to pray for you today. So if this is a struggle or if you want to grow in self-control in this or any other area of your life, then you can click request prayer. You can follow the URL to the website and we're here to pray to strengthen and support you. The second quality that Paul explores is becoming ambitious. In verse 11, he says, and make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you to, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will no, not be dependent on anyone. Forbes describes ambition as someone who is eager, 
determined and goal oriented. And I think if you picture an ambitious person, you think of someone who's getting up early to seize the day, who's motivated and driven towards their goals. And what's the goal that Paul sets for us? To lead a quiet life. It feels like such a strange ambition to be ambitiously quiet. And I think it raises two questions for me. The first is, how is this even possible to live a quiet life in our noisy world? Like clearly Paul is not living in 2021 with that morning struggle of your phone being the first thing you engage with in the morning. And as soon as you unlock it, you're flooded with notifications and news headlines and TikTok trends. And it continues throughout the day. Microsoft surveyed um, and find that 77% of people said when nothing is occupying their attention, the first thing they do is reach for their phones. We are never without noise. The noise of opinion, the noise of comparison, the noise of distraction. And I suppose the temptation can be that in response to all the noise, we feel like we have to compete with it in order to make an impact. So maybe what Paul's saying is that we don't need to shout louder. And then the second question that this raises for me is, aren't Christians told to go into all nations, to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, to share the good news, to be unashamed of our faith, to heal the sick and cast out demons? Like none of that feels particularly quiet. When Paul uses the word quiet, He's not just talking about volume, but peace and restfulness. And the word ambition here in the Greek is also defined as consider it your honor and privilege. So essentially what he's saying to us is in this world full of noise, consider it your privilege to live a life of peace. An ambitiously quiet life isn't small or passive or lacking in power. Jesus is meek. The Holy Spirit is gentle. And God the Father often chooses to speak in a whisper. Your life doesn't have to be loud to have impact. So how do we become ambitious in living the quiet life? Firstly, Become ambitious in loving others. We read in verse nine, now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you brothers and sisters to do so more and more. The Thessalonians were really good at this. They were really good at loving each other within the church. And that's why Paul commends them on it. Living a life of peace has allowed them to live more selflessly and think about other people and meet their needs. Which, to be honest, sounds a lot like you guys. Since HGBB has gone online, so many of you have been thinking and innovating ways to love each other and to serve the church. I think of our CHGBB team who put on their red t-shirts every Sunday and prepare content and deliver it via Zoom to the kids. Or our youth who have just finished a social action series. You can watch all the interviews on YouTube. And even at this time, they're thinking about how can we serve and love people around us? Plus, so many of you have signed up to help host our online services every Sunday and you're available to welcome and to pray for people. It's incredible. We can misunderstand the quiet life as being small and insular. But what we learn is that when we're ambitious to love each other well, it only results in growth. The Thessalonians began with loving their immediate church, their brothers and sisters, and then it spread out across the city and then it spread out across the whole province of Macedonia. When we model loving each other well, the impact reaches far beyond our own church walls. The second practical way to become ambitious in our quiet lives is to become ambitious in your day-to-day. -day. We read in verse 11, 
and make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so you will not be dependent on anyone. It's quite likely that Paul wrote this to the Thessalonians because they misunderstood something. They thought that Jesus's return was imminent, like Jesus was gonna come back next week. And so it's thought that a lot of them had decided to quit their jobs because, you know, why work hard and labor under the sun if we're all gonna go to heaven next week? And so Paul's concern is, people are gonna view the Christians as lazy and they're gonna see them sponging off richer people within the church. But worse than that, when people are bored, they get up in other people's business, gossiping and intruding because there's not much else for them to do. And so Paul is really direct here. He says, mind your own business. Like there's nothing to develop here. That's what it is, mind your own business but not in a way that we live apart from one another with no concern, as we've just seen, they loved each other well, but he wants them to stop being unnecessarily disruptive. So his solution is work with your hands. Work is an integral part of God's plan for society and the church. Whatever that looks like for you, whether in the home or in the office, we are called not to just waste our lives waiting to go to heaven. And what I love about the ordinariness of this passage is it's not just big, huge, life-changing experiences that sanctify us, but actually we're encouraged to view our everyday, ordinary lives with the potential to shape us. It's through our daily lives that we have an opportunity to win the respect of outsiders. Because as we experience things, we're encouraged to not go through them and come out the other side more bitter or more angry, but to come out of the other side more holy. To allow everything we go through to shape us into who Jesus says we are. And that's what it's all about. The quiet life isn't a hidden life because as we model becoming like Jesus to the world around us, we show that there is a different and a better way to live. Amen. 